Welcome to, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> welcome to Martini Time. So, this is the, uh, it's not the happy half hour, it's the ha it, not the happy hour, it's the happy half hour. When I uh, get to uh, come and talk with you and just uh, not only share what happened during the day, but just what happened in the last minute. I mean, every, or just, it, so because this is kind of like a, uh, uh, as if, if you're just dropping in, uh, this uh, martini time, uh, when I first started it, uh, I, I said I was a martini priest because my uncle, uh, who was a uh, ordained uh, martini priest, uh, when he died, he left me his uh, martini glasses, 500 of them, and uh, uh, the recipe for uh, the perfect martini. And so uh, I'm an ordained martini priest, you know, and uh, and this is the uh, uh, the communion. This is the mass. This is the uh, um, it's, a, it's a metaphor, but this is the Eucharist, you know. So basically, I'm creating. I you know I'm not a Catholic, and uh, even if I were, and I have to go to the church to have the Eucharist and all that, and the priest would be have to have a priest and all of that formal ritual stuff, but. Uh, my, my, uh, you know, I, I'm in a place where uh, I want it to be all the, you know, I want it to, to be 24-7 uh, Eucharist. You know, why just categorize it and put it into a church on Sunday and make me dependent upon a priest? I, I take the power into my own hands. I, I grab the handle. I, I grab the tiger, you know, and I'll create my own Eucharist. Right there, you see. So, so this is my body. This is my blood. And I invite you to share in this Mass, you see, because I prepared it just like a priest prepares the Eucharist. And I'm sharing it here in this little 20-minute uh, uh, Mass, you see. Uh, you may call it a mess, but it's... it's <laughs> It's, but what is what is this Eucharist? You see, it transum, There's a transubstantiation in the Catholics. There's a, a transum, There's something called transubstantiation. It means that the bread and the wine is magically turned into the body of Christ. You see, it's not just it's not just a symbol, like in Protestant churches where you they don't even have wine. They have grape juice. And so they and they say right up front, you know, in remembrance of me. So this is a symbol of something that happened in the past. Well, that's dead. That's dead. That's a dead ritual. You're just celebrating. It's like remembering your birthday. You know, when were you born? Oh, way back, you know, 1936, you see. So we celebrate that. But your real birthday is right now. You're being born right now. Every moment you are either potentially uh, born or potentially dead. <laughs> if you're not born again every moment, well then you're just born yesterday. You know, born in the past and you just remember your birth, you see. But I don't want to remember my birth. I want to be born again. And that's what the Mass is all about. That's what the Eucharist is all about, is being your everyday mind, your everyday world, your mundane cultural social ego, you see, is transubstantiated into a living self. This is what I was talking about last night when I was trying to uh, you know, uh, uh, connect and describe and understand uh, the guru principle. That's when you have a, uh, you know, a guru you know, which is very difficult to understand in our culture, and a Christ principle, you know. And they're both the same to me. So I try to explain that. Because if you can, exp if you can translate uh, this, these rituals and these concepts into something that's living, you see, then it becomes you. Uh, then, then the truth, you are your truth, not somebody else's truth. You see, so I'm very passionately involved in, in being my truth. You know, that's why I come here um, exposed. <laughs> yeah. 
in the sense that I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't come here under pretense. I don't come here with uh, preparation. Uh, I come here with anything that will protect me from being an idiot. <laughs> so that, so uh, so I made this title. So I, I made the title of this, and I just typed it out. Uh, because I just I just created it a few minutes ago. I, uh, I have a friend of mine uh, who uh, um, I don't know, he apologizes a lot, right? And I said, wait a minute. I said this house is going to be from now on an apology-free zone, an apology-free house. In this house, you don't have to apologize for anything. Uh, and, and I and I begin to look up, look at that. Let, let's dig into that a moment. We're always doing it, you know. It's not just my everybody. We're always apologizing for ourselves, uh, making an excuse for existing. Uh, you know, making making uh, uh, you know just uh, there's there's a deep sense of not being worthy inside of us in America. There's a deep sense of not being complete, of not being finished of needing something else, you know. So there's always this sense of apology. There's always the sense of, uh, of uh, apologizing for not measuring up, you see. And so, and this is what Buddhism is all about. It's about existing without apology. And so I'm, I'm kind of like sharing that model with you here. I mean this, you know, when I come here and talk about the Christ principle or uh, the guru principle, or whatever I talk about, I talk about it without apology. And that's not easy. Try it sometime. You see, because it's not easy, because what will people think? Who do you think you are? Jesus Christ? Who you think you're a guru? You see, you see what I mean? You think you're a spiritual teacher? Quote, you see? Who do you think you are? How dare you think you are something? You should apologize. You see how that gets framed? If you try to be your true self, the culture, the crowd, the herd, the mob will say, who do you think you are? You should apologize for your sin of being true to yourself. You see? You see how that goes? So oh, we don't want to be uh, rejected. We don't want to, don't want to be cast out. Because our self, our social ego, the one that we've been enculturated in from the day we were born in this culture, or any culture, that cultural ego doesn't want to be cast out, doesn't want to be alone, doesn't want to be in exile like Napoleon on Mount Elba, on the island of Elba, or St. Helena. Right. That's kind of a classic uh, metaphor for Napoleon who dared to be true to himself and to claim the crown. Who do you think you are? An emperor? Who, who do you think you are? Napoleon? <laughs> so for his sin, he was exiled. Not that he didn't deserve it, but I'm just talking metaphorically. <laughs> See, so, so even, uh, even Jesus, you see, was true to himself and look what happened to him. Yeah, right. <laughs> so this whole idea of apology um, is really quite deep, I think. I need to look into it more. Because it goes on in our own mind, you see. It's not just in the external world. We internalize the external world and we live in that. A roof brain chatter going on, yada, 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 yada. Self-recrimination. There. If, if you can catch it in here, it'll disappear out there. If you can catch the uh, apology in here, you can eliminate it out there. That's where it begins. This is where it starts, right up here in the mind, you see. The apology, the, oh, you know, you know that just self, you know, self, self-flagellation, self-doubt. And that, and that basically is what the ego is. The socially, the social ego. Now, I'm not talking about the, e, the e, there's nothing wrong with an ego. It's a center of I, you see. You, we have to have that. You can't do without that. Otherwise, you'd just be a, uh, there's no, you know, what, we'd be in a, be a whiteout, you know, when there's a, uh, a snowstorm and there's a whiteout. 
you, you uh, panic because if you've ever experienced this when you're driving, you, go, you see the road and suddenly there's a whiteout and now you can't tell where the road is, you can't tell what's up or what's down. Uh, people in airplanes experience this when uh, when it's foggy and their their uh, instruments don't work. You know, they, they're, in other words, they they don't trust the instruments and they think they're right side up, but they're upside down. They can't tell which is up or down. So we all go through places to experience where there is a loss of a uh, reference point and we lose our center, and it's terrifying because you don't you there's nothing to anchor you. Uh, this called psychosis, you know, or just chaos, or uh, you know, this uh, this uh, moment of panic where we lose our center, and so this this need to apologize, this need to uh, uh, say I'm sorry, uh, this need, this sense of sin or guilt, this sense of uh, not being politically correct, the sense of being out of sync, the sense of being somehow out of alignment a little bit, you see. Somehow I'm a little bit off, you know. I need to correct because, uh, you know, I'm a little bit, something's wrong with me, something's wrong, you see. That whole sense, you know, it's very nefarious, but it's very deep and profound. And, uh, and, so, and so we have to uh, uh, find a seat that is not apologetic. And this, see, meta Buddhism, the Buddha, particularly the legend of the Buddha, uh, when he left his palace and went into the town and saw old age sickness and death and said, oh, I gotta find a release from that. I have to find a way out of old age sickness and death. He wasn't talking about the physical old age sickness and death. He was talking about the psychology of it. And so he went through all the uh, yoga traditions of the day, found them limiting. And then he got found a tree and said, I'm going to sit here until I awaken and, find, and break the code, until I break the enigma code of consciousness, is what he was doing. When I break the enigma code of the social ego. And I say social ego because the ego is a relationship with society and what society thinks about you. And so it's a placement. You can't have one without the other. If you, have a so, if you have a social ego, that's an ego that references itself to society. And you have society that's made up of all these egos, you see. So it's one network, you see. It's like Fred and Ginger Rogers, they dance together. So it's a very powerful network, this, this social slash ego, you see. It, the part makes the whole, and the whole makes the part. In the same way, and I hold this up a lot, the cell phone. So you could say this is a social ego. And it's the center of the internet. So the internet makes this and this makes the internet. So the internet, this universal network, is, experiences itself as a particle as formed through this. And this experiences the universal through this, you see. So this is kind of like a Eucharist. Ah, now let's connect the dots here. So the Mass, let's get back to the Catholic Mass. Um, they really, you know, I mean that's been the center of Catholicism. This one single ritual, the Mass. Uh, you know, that, you know that, that is the center pole of the whole shebang, of the whole tent, you see. So this, this Mass is, a, is alchemy. It's, it's a, a, a point of intersection between the universal and the particular form, immediate form, the concrete. So you are concrete. You are a particular form, you see, a thing, a unique object, a unique thing. And I don't even like to use the word thing, but a unique person. In the whole cosmos, you are the unique one. There is no other one like you. You are the unique one in the cosmos. So the cosmos is kind of like the internet. And then this would be the unique one, you see, because it's got stuff on it that no other cell phone has, in that sense. That's, I'm just metaphorically speaking here, so hang in there. Let's, let's, let's make the leap, you see. Let's, let's do some, uh, let, let's jump over the, the hurdles here and get a bigger grasp you see, okay? 
So you are the unique one without a second. There is no second to you. Every individual is the unique one without a second. And now that's the way we define God. God is the one without a second. That's why old Yahweh in the Bible said, you'll have no other gods before me. I'm the one. And of course, Trump says that too. I'm the one. There are no other presidents before me. I'm the one. <laughs> Connect the dots. So? So we're looking at um, the mass as a intersection of the universal which is unknown, by the way, because if you see something, you're, it's not universal. Everything you perceive is the one. In other words, if I hold up, say this, all right? So this is a little conch shell my daughter gave me many years ago, and I just kept it. You see? That's the unique one. There's no other shell. Of course, there's other ones that may look like this, but if you start analyzing it, it's going to be different. It's going to be the unique one. There's going to be some little difference about this that no other conch shell has. The unique one, you see. So you are the, even if you are a t identical twin, there's going to be something about you that's unique that nobody else has, you see. Fingerprints, anything. So you get the idea. You are the unique one, and yet the unique one is also the whole cosmos, the universal. But, you, but the universal manifests itself as every object, you. So the whole God, the universal, the totality, the cosmos, the big mama. <laughs> the, 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 and this is why you can't know it, because if you know it, it becomes something. So the totality includes all the known. You know it's there, but you can't know it as a thing. Because once you know something as a thing, you separate it from the other things, and it's not the one. So hang in here with me. Uh, we're, we're flying high here. <laughs> so, so you're the unique, unique one. So the whole cosmos, God, if you want to use that, but don't get suckered into thinking God's a thing. See, so don't, you know, so we'll just use that word, but say the self, um, the universal, um, the Buddha, or whatever you want to call it. Every religion has its own name. Big mind and Zen. So this uh, one, you see, uh, manifests itself in you and in me. So all of us are the unique one. But you see, our perception, our mind, our social ego, our cultural perception sees everything as things. So there's a real contradiction here. Because we are conditioned to see everything as separate things. So we can't see the, the universal. All we can see is separate things. And then everything is uh, defined and categorized by the mind, you see. But this is totally an objective view from culture. And that's where we're trapped. So the transubstantiation of the mass is a shift or a flip from seeing myself as just one among many, I'm just many people among the world, millions, billions of people, we're all just ants running around here, being born and dying, being squashed, whatever, living in little ant colonies, America's an ant colony, France is an ant colony, England's an ant colony, and the ant colonies are fighting each other. You see? And every ant colony has a queen or a center that holds it together, you see. So this, but, but this, this is an objective view. So no, no matter how, how much you zoom out, it's all just ants. It's all just things. Or no matter how you zoom in from this view, it's just a bunch of in, uh, atoms and molecules and things. So no so matter how far you go in, zoom in, or how far you zoom out, you still end up with a bunch of things. It's all things, you see. 
But that's just one, that's the objective view of the culture, which actually was born with the Enlightenment. The Western Enlightenment gave birth to that view, created science. Now you can fix things. But it came, became common sense. It became the only view. So the view that you are the unique one who has no apology for existence, the idea, the radical revolutionary idea that you are the unique one without a second who does not apologize for your existence because you are existence. You have a right to exist. You have a right to be here. You are the center of the world. You are the son of God. You are the son of man. You are the Christ principle or the guru principle or the self principle or individuation or whatever you want to call it. Don't call it anything. But you are that. I am that, you see. Now that doesn't mean that the object of you is discounted. I think my bell rang, but I'll finish up. It just means that the primary view, the primary knowledge, the primary knowing is that you are the center of the world and you have no apologies to make. I mean, you can make mistakes and you can correct them, but you, but you don't feel, you're not worthy, you don't feel the guilt, you don't feel the sin. So that shift then becomes the primary view and then the secondary shift of culture comes in and it's okay, you can run around, catch a bus, get a job, do fix stuff, whatever you want to do. But whatever you want to do in that objective view, when it's centered in the primary view, is going to be correct action. Because you're not reacting to the world as somebody who's a failure, who's somebody that's not worthy of existence, who somebody has to apologize for existing. So make your life an apology-free zone. Do it right now. <laughs> if, you, if you fall off the wagon and apologize, in, or inside or outside, uh, find yourself lacking or in doubt, doubt, you see. All of these negativities. If you find yourself self-flagellating yourself, if you find yourself flagellating yourself, you see, just, oh, wait a minute, no apologies. No apologies. I'm okay. No apologies. No apology needed. Thanks for dropping in.